it was just said that everybody had to work in a work camp. We thought there was something funny because no, no sound came back, you know, no letters came back or anything like to do anybody. So by then you thought you feared the worst, yeah. But you didn't know what happened, not really. But I always say so, it's unbelievable. I can hardly believe it myself, although I've experienced it. My name is Selma van der Per. I was the courier and resistance fighter in Holland during World War II. And I was arrested in 1944 and sent to concentration camp Ravensbrück. I knew I was Jewish, but otherwise I had plenty of friends um, who were Catholic and Protestants, and they knew I was Jew Jewish, but we never talked about it, really. The war in Europe was already um, in September 39, and our war only started, the invasion of the Germans started in Holland on the 10th of May 1940, so several months after the European war. I had two brothers and a sister, and my brother Louis, who was the eldest and 13 years older than me, was an officer in the Merchant Navy. And he came at five o'clock in the morning and shook me awake. Wake, wake up, wake up, wake up, it's war. And I said, oh boy, l let me sleep. He said, the Germans have invaded. Uh, and I could hear the pilots and the noise. So I got up and he had to be back at six o'clock on his ship. It never occurred to us to go with, on the boat as well. When we heard later on, of course, about people all fleeing, we thought of done that, but we never thought of it. So we said goodbye to my brother, and he never saw my parents or sister again. And then we went home, back to my mother. But when I was hiding myself uh, at the end of 42 in Leiden with some doctors, and they were telling stories about bringing people to hiding places and the things that happened and so. And I said, can I help? And they said, oh yes, would you? The first few weeks I was just putting paper into envelopes, you know, and sent them away. So that's how I started to be involved. And if, you know, I could, quite soon I had some quite difficult jobs to do. Beginning of 43, the Germans notified the Dutch that they would have new ration cards. And one man said, uh, would you mind being a guinea pig and go and get a new identity card? And so um, that's what I did. He had arranged with the man in the registry office where the identity cards were given out. And this man was helping. And he had a little baby who died after a few months. And they took out the death certificate. He took it out of, because you know all the cards are in the thing. And um, made me Margarete van der Kuyt, her, her name. And that's what I had as a name all the time. And with that card, I was asked to go and get some ration cards. And I did, and I got them. On the, on the identity card. And then I was asked to get some vouchers and get some shoes. And because you, had, you needed vouchers for everything, you see. And I did uh, several other vouchers as well, and it all went fine. Yeah, there was a lot of control, of course, in the trains. It was almost every day, yes. But I got used to it. Once I got through the first few half a dozen, I mean, I, I didn't bother anymore, you know. They didn't bother to be anxious anymore. <laughs> I did one day and wanted me to go to Paris to the headquarters, to well, to German office, to get an, uh, a paper, a German paper with a German stamp and German adding. And uh, I said, oh, it's much too dangerous. I don't want to do that. But they said, yes, but our boys in prison and we need those papers and so on and so on. So in the end I went. You couldn't go official, of course, crossing a border. That was not possible because you didn't have a passport or anything like that. It was much too dangerous. So I went to the farmer because in, on the continent, don't forget, one farm borders on the other farm. One farm in Holland borders on the farm 
in Belgium. Maybe a ditch or something, which is the border, but hardly anything. So I stayed the night with farmer near the border, and um, he brought me very early in the morning to the end of his farm, where I crossed, and there was nobody there. So there was danger with it, of course. But on the whole, they couldn't patrol the whole of the border, of course, it was much too long. So, and the farmers seemed to know these things. And then I was in France, and I walked to the nearest train station and took a train to Paris. And then from Paris, when I arrived at the station, I walked to the office. I can't remember the name of the street and the rue anymore. Um, but uh, I, had, I was there at the office, and I was a bit anxious, to tell you the truth, yes. <laughs> but I was given a name of a man who was going to give me this envelope with the letter in it. So I gave this name, and they asked me what, what did I want, and so I gave the name, and he was there within a few, few seconds. He expected me. He knew I was coming. But I took this envelope and put it in my head back and off I went again. It was quite simple. And I was quite surprised about this, myself actually. But I was told after the war that the man who gave me the thing had infiltrated the Gestapo headquarters. And that he really was one of the group. So I thought, well, that's probably why it went off so easily. I mean, I was very lucky because I was arrested as a non-Jew. But otherwise, most Jewish people who were in the resistance didn't survive. My boss was caught in the train. Um, and they took him home. And just that day, I was there in his room. And I could hear the door open down there. I said, oh, there's the boss. And I opened the door and I saw Peter between two Grüne Polizei, that's German police. And he, he didn't know we were going to be there, of course. And um, he, was, he became very white and so. And, we, and I tried to flee up to the second floor. This was on the first floor, to the second floor. But they got me back. And they interrogated us there. And I said, I was only a girlfriend. I didn't know anything. And those two Grüne police, I believed that. But the next day, I was taken to Amsterdam by the same two fat, very fat, Germans, but when I got out of the car at the headquarters, that was the Gestapo headquarters in Holland, the um, men accompanying me said, oh, the girl has nothing to do with it. So I thought, oh, lovely. <laughs> and then he said, I don't believe it, glaub ich nicht. I don't believe it, so my heart sank in my shoes. And they took me in, took me up, up the steps and then to, into a huge room and they put me in a big chair and took my hand back. And I thought, oh God, it's different having your papers controlled, checked in the train or at the exit, different from Gestapo headquarters, because they may have machinery here and so. So I was really anxious, but I kept on smiling to them and so as if nothing mattered. Well, after quite a while, they came back and then I was sent to, um, to the main prison in Amsterdam, Amsterdam, a huge prison, and put in a cell with um, five other women, with one bed. But I was scared to sleep, for instance, because I was scared that I would give my own name, you see, or things that had happened at home or something. I was scared to death to go to sleep. But of course, after the first night and so, I fell asleep the second night. <laughs> you can't stay asleep all the time. I was in the prison for a few weeks, and then I was sent to Fürth, the Dutch concentration camp in the south of Holland, near Eindhoven. But on the 4th of September, the Allies were near the border of Holland and Belgium. And so we could hear the shooting effect. And we thought, ah, we're going to be freed, you know, we're going to be free. So, but no, they pushed us in the, in the train. I tried to flee, flee under a mattress, creep under a mattress, but uh, an officer in a guard was just in time. She saw my legs still hanging out and she pulled me out and put me in the last wagon. And the others had already gone and I was really in a way a bit luck. And we were only with 12 women there. So all the others were with 70 and 80. 
the, the women were workers from the kitchen, and that's why they were so late. And um, they had managed to take a big barrel with food. And so we were lucky because most of the others had nothing. And we traveled for three days and two nights before we arrived in Ravensbrück. They had some toilet paper with them as well, which was, of course, very good. And I got a piece of them, of it, and I wrote a little note to my friend Greet Brinkhuis in Amsterdam, saying, I think we are on our way to Germany. I'm in the cattle wagon and so on. I dropped it through the split in the wooden shell things. It was the last stop before we traveled, we crossed into Germany. Unbelievable thing is that it was found, probably by the station master, and he sent it to my friend. But she forgot all about it. And I forgot all about it after the war. And only about five or six years before she died, which was in 2000, 2009, did she have to move and she found the box. And in the box she found my little note. So she gave it to me then. I tried to find the man, actually, because he'd, he'd sent it in an envelope with his name, address, but he wasn't there anymore. I'm very sorry I couldn't thank the man. It was on the 23rd of April. We were told to get stand outside the black block, and we did, and we said, oh, now we are, we are being killed, you know. That's what we said all the time. We had to march to the main camp, we all thought we were going to be killed now. And I said to my friend, I mean, surely not after we've gone through all this are we going to be killed. Nothing you could do about it because SS men and, and female guards with their dogs were next to you, you know, walking on the outside. And then we were put in a big uh, hut and uh, for about nine days. And every day we thought, oh, every day we had to stand outside for uh, counting. And um, then we thought, oh gosh, you know, are we going today or not? And then there came the day that they told us to march to the gate. And we were really scared. And then we were standing outside the gate. We were standing there for a very long time. And then there came a little car, a little sports car, and a young man in it, and he jumped out, and he said he was Swedish, and a friend of Count Bernadotte from the Swedish Red Cross, head of the Swedish Red Cross, was coming to um, save us and take to Sweden. It was only then that we thought, oh, well, it's true, we are freed. Then the next morning, three trucks arrived, and so the young ones of us, our group, jumped in, we were told to jump in, and the trucks um, took us to towards De Denmark, of course. And we stopped after about half an hour, and we went into the woods, and they gave us uh, sandwiches and chocolates and everything else, lovely drinks and so. And it was a beautiful wood. The spring was just making all these fine green shoots, you know, and, and there were already flowers as well because it had been lovely weather. Um, and we, we really hadn't seen anything like that for years, some of us at least. And then we went on to Sweden. When I arrived in Sweden, in, in Malmö, they had opened uh, rooms in a museum, in Malmö Museum for us, and they'd put mattresses down. But before we could lie down, we had to give our name to a Dutch attaché who was sitting behind a uh, table. And, I was, and we were asked to queue up, which we were used to anyhow. I went to the back of it as the last one. And being always very careful, I still was all the time. And um, gave my name, Margareta van der Kuyt. And then we all went to the mattresses and to lie down. But I didn't lie down. I thought I must go back and give my own name. I was still very scared and very hesitate, hesitant about it. And so I went back to the little room where the man was, and he luckily was still there, the Dutchman. And I said to him, do these lists go to Holland? No, he said, Holland is still occupied. I said, but where do they go to? No, they go to England, he said. I said, but England is still 
at war with Germany. Oh, he said, but they go in the diplomatic post. Why are you so interested? And I did not dare to give my own name for a long time. I hesitated and I said, well, 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 you see, actually my name is not Margrethe van der Kuyt, but Selma Vellema. So he just looked, took his pen out of his pocket, crushed it on the thing out and put my name in. And that was all. And there was a big hall with a stage where we could also do some uh, theater with some of us. A man stood on the stage and said, is there a Selma Velleman here? So I stood up and I said, yes, that's me. He said, I've got a telegram for you. Well, I opened the telegram. It was for my brother David from London, who was administrative person uh, at the Dutch embassy. And he had seen my name on that list. And he sent a telegram straight away. Lovely, you're alive. What about Pa, Mu, Mum and Clara? My friends were dead surprised. And they called me Marga for a long, long, long time afterwards, still, still in Holland. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for watching this video. You can click the link and buy my book, My Name is Selma.